Greetings. You are very welcome to another uh, Ancient Order Hibernians in America history presentation. Today is May 27th, which brings us to our Memorial Day weekend here in America. So we have a lot of celebration and um, in remembrance of uh, those who have given their lives, the men and women who have given their lives uh, for our great country. And we're very proud uh, to be here today with a um, a day where we're going to discuss Liam Lynch and uh, the most recent book on Liam Lynch, uh, written by Gerard Shannon. And before I turn it over to Dan, I want to remind everybody who we are. We're the Ancient Order Hibernians in America, as I said. We're the largest and oldest Irish Catholic organization in the United States of America. We're the only Irish organization in the United States that has membership in all 50 states. We are also, we believe, the largest Irish organization outside Ireland. That being said, I will turn it over to our chair, Daniel Taylor. Thank you, Danny. Um, we're, we're now at, nearing the end of the so-called decade of centenaries, which has been a 10 or so year period of time in which those of us interested in Irish history and modern Ireland have been studying and reflecting upon the corresponding period a century ago that was so critical in the shaping of modern Ireland. Uh, back in 2013, we looked at the Dublin lockout. In 2016, of course, there was tremendous attention to the centenary of the Easter Rising of 1916. In 2018, we looked at the landslide Sinn Féin electoral success of 1918, and then the formation of the, the first Doyle, and then, of course, the Irish War of Independence, the Tan War. And then in 2021, we looked back at the Anglo-Irish Treaty and then the vote on the treaty uh, in January of 1922, which, of course, resulted in a 64 to 57 uh, affirmation of the treaty, which led to the De Valera anti-treaty walkout of the Doyle, the split in the IRA, and then, of course, beginning with the shelling of the four courts and the Battle of Dublin in June of 1922, the Irish Civil War. A little more than 100 years ago, on May 23rd, 1923, the Irish Civil War came to an end when IRA Chief of Staff Frank Aiken gave the dump arms order to the anti-treaty forces. And as Danny said, today our program looks back at the life of Liam Lynch, Chief of Staff of the IRA, leader of the anti-treaty military forces at the time of his death on April 10th, 1923. We are very fortunate to have with us today Irish historian Gerard Shannon. Uh, Gerard, as Danny said, is the author of the first full-length treatment of the life of Liam Lynch in decades with his uh, release in April of this year of Liam Lynch to Declare a Republic, which uh, has its origin in Gerard's 19, or, sorry, 2019 master's thesis. Uh, Gerard is a, a native of Scaries, a coastal town in, in North Dublin County and has been in very high demand in the past month or two as a featured speaker at Lynch commemorations around Ireland and in various forums like ours. And so we're very pleased today uh, to welcome Gerard Shannon to talk to us about the life of William Lynch. Gerard. Thank you very much, Daniel, for the kind introduction. And just to say to you and all your members, it's a pleasure to be speaking with you here this afternoon. If you'll just bear with me for a moment or two, I'm just gonna share my screen. I'll share the PowerPoint now. Lovely. So it's appropriate to be discussing General Liam Lynch today, as this past Wednesday, as Daniel mentioned, marked the centenary of the end of the Irish Civil War. Now, arguably, the beginning of the end of the Civil War began on the 10th of April, 1923, with Liam Lynch's death. General Liam Lynch was one of the most important IRA leaders of the Irish Revolution of the early 20th century, and he remains an iconic Irish Republican figure, celebrated as a brave and committed soldier, dedicated to the overthrow of British rule in Ireland. And he was also, of note, one of the most commemorated individuals of the period. Now, over the next 30 minutes or so, I'm going to give a broad outline of his life and highlight some of the material I found over the course of the research of my new book, Liam Lynch, To Declare a Republic. 
And we'll start at the beginning. Now, Liam Lynch is a celebrated leader of the IRA in Cork, but it may surprise many of you to learn that he was actually from rural Limerick and he was very proud of these roots. He grew up in the townland of Barnagira outside the village of Anglesborough in Limerick. And Anglesborough itself is close to Limerick's border with Cork and roughly five miles from the town of Mitchellstown. Liam was born in 1892. He was the second youngest of seven siblings in a large rural farming family. He was the son of a Fenian, and his mother was a member of the Ballyanders Ladies Land League. So here already you can see the influence of two of the two of the revolutionary currents in Ireland in the late 19th century, that of Fenianism and the land war and their impact on Liam Lynch's backgrounds. And he was very close to his two brothers, Martin and Tom. You can see pictures here on the right. And both brothers would actually join religious orders. Martin would become Brother Plastus and the Christian brothers. And Tom Lynch would become a Catholic priest in Australia. Now, we're very fortunate in that we've over 30 items of correspondence from Liam to his brother Tom over the course of 1917 to 1922. Many of these can be viewed online on the National Library of Ireland website. And they have a great personal insight into the person that Liam Lynch was. And this combined with the thousands of surviving military communications from the period, we also get a sense of the military leader that Liam Lynch was. Now, with Liam, the second youngest in his family, he never stood to inherit his father's farm. So in his, er, in his late teens, he went to work as a shop apprentice in nearby Mitchellstown. And there, subsequently, he was a shop clerk in Formoy by 1916. Now, it was in 1914, he first joined the Irish Volunteers, specifically the Mitchellstown Volunteers. And here's a very rare photo of him marching with the Mitchellstown Volunteers in 1914, going through the town of Ballyporeen in County Tipperary. And there's a cropped segment of the photo where you can see Liam just a little bit more clearly. Now, in the, these new social circles in Mitchellstown and later from Moy, Liam became very active in the Gaelic League, that great Irish language organisation, though he, it was ne- he, by his own admission, he was never to fully grasp the Irish language. But attending the classes and the Gaelic League dances was to be a very important social outlet for him, as it was for many of that generation. Now, what's worth noting, with the volunteer split in 1914, Lynch actually initially joined the Redmondite section of the volunteers that was to become the National Volunteers. And you can actually see his membership card for the National Volunteers again on the National Library of Ireland website. Though the organisation, the National Volunteers, it mostly just fades away on a national level after 1914, following Redmond's call for Irishmen to join the British Army. As Liam's brother Tom later wrote, Liam was surprised at John Redmond for recruiting into the British Army, and he was only trying to find his political bearings in the period. And it's worth noting by 1916, for Liam, everything changes. So we mainly know the Easter Rising as an event that happened in Dublin, but there was an event that happened in Cork during Easter week 1916. In the early hours of the 2nd of May 1916, the home of the Kent family at Bannard House, outside the village of Castle Lyons, which itself was in North Cork, was the centre of dramatic shootout between the Kent family in the house and members of the RAC and British Army. The Kent brothers, Thomas, William, David and Richard, were prominent in the volunteer movement locally. In the aftermath, an RAC's constable was killed, as was the youngest member of the Kent family, Richard. Now, that's a very famous photo there on the left. It depicts Thomas and William Kent being led handcuffed and barefoot through the streets of Formoy. They're going over the main bridge in Formoy across the Blackwater River. And they're being escorted by members of the British Army as they're being taken to the local RAC barracks. There in the middle, the dark clothed men, that's Thomas on the left and William on the right. Now, this is the very scene that Liam Lynch himself witnesses on the bridge in Formoy in the morning of the 2nd of May, 1916. And he would be he would know that Thomas K he would he would realize later Thomas Kent on the 9th of May 1916 is executed for his part at the shootout at Bannard House. And Thomas Kent's execution was the only one that happened outside Dublin, along with of course Roger Casement uh, in England in August. Now Hannah Cleary, Liam's godmother and captain in the Angles were coming him on, later said in an interview with Ernie O'Malley. Liam was an ordinary nationalist until the day the British attacked the Kents and he saw Thomas Kent being brought out bleeding through the town of Formoy. The Kent brothers were barefooted. Liam said then he would join up with the Irish volunteers. He said that when he saw the Kents going through the town of Formoy, it was like a sword going through his heart. 
everything changes for Liam from that point on. He was not yet, however, in late 1916, early 1917, the most obvious military leader. His later comrade in the IRA, Moss Toomey, remembered first meeting a rather aloof, serious and retiring young man, a very shy man. And given that Liam wore glasses and he tended to dress well, Toomey felt Liam looked more like a scholar rather than a man of action. Not at all the type of man one would imagine who would handle a gun and lead men into battle. Now, it's to be clear, Toomey is writing ironically here. He wrote this in a piece for a booklet published on the 50th anniversary of Liam's death. Toomey himself was to become a trusted and loyal comrade for Liam Lynch in the IRA's Cork No. 2 Brigade and would be very devoted to Liam's memory over the course of his own long life. In the same recollection, Toomey wrote the following. Liam was, was himself, in what in great measure he expected from his comrades, a dedicated soldier and a true patriot, even unto death. So in early 1917, Liam joins the Formoy Company of the Irish Volunteers, becomes his first lieutenant, quickly works his way up the ranks. So by mid-1918, he's adjutant of the Formoy Battalion. And it's actually in late 1917, he wrote the most famous words associated with him. You can see the extract from the letter to his brother Tom there on the right, written on the 1st of November 1917. The words, many of you would know them, we have declared for an Irish Republic and will not live under any other law. And of course, no other law is the title of the first biography of his life. And I, of course, also paraphrase the title to declare a republic for my own book. Now, from this juncture onwards, 1918, 1917 to 1918, Liam develops this frequent kind of habit of his when he's in the military command. He has frequent on the ground inspe inspection and investigation of the various companies. He meets the officers. He has conferences with them. He hears out their suggestions. He just debates tactics and strategy with them. And one of his comrades, George Power, later remarked, Liam was the driving force in organizing the Fermoy Battalion and helping to develop the backward companies. And it's in this period in 1918 that Liam Lynch is very central to the volunteers' efforts to resist conscription. Now, the conscription crisis, just to briefly summarize, is when the British government in Westminster tried to impose conscription in Ireland, force Irish men to join the British Army during the Great War. And much of Irish society, Catholic Church, political parties, and the volunteers organized, protested, and planned to resist this. And of course, it never went ahead because, really, because the war ended by late 1918. But because of his organizational efforts during the conscription crisis, Liam Lynch comes to the attention of the volunteer leadership, such as Michael Collins and Richard Mulcahy, and he also impresses those under his command. So by the end of 1918, with no formal soldiering experience, Liam Lynch, with an extraordinary sense of self-belief and demonstrating incredible devotion to his cause, impressed those in the volunteers. So it should be of no surprise that he came to such prominence in the War of Independence, which began the following year. Now, in early January 1919, just before the War of Independence begins, Liam Lynch is unanimously elected the head of the new Cork No. 2 Brigade of the Volunteers, soon, of course, to be more commonly known as the Irish Republican Army. And Cork No. 2 Brigade, or North Cork, you know, encompasses much of the northern part of the county. It includes battalions of familiar towns, such as Fermoy and Mallory, 1919, the first day the Dell meets, members of the IRA, so Tipperary Brigade, attack members of the RAC at Salahed Bay and Tipperary. So this kind of presents, you know, potential challenge for the neighbouring brigades for Cork Number Two under Lynch. Like, how are they going to strike out against British forces? Now, one of the most notable, and certainly one of the most, you know, impressive um, actions undertaken by Lynch's brigade during the War of Independence was the Moy Arms Brigade which took place on the 7th of September, and I think often overlooked. It was the first engagement that the volunteers had with members of the British Army since the 1916 Easter Rising. You know, just as the War of Independence began, it had mainly been RAC targets. This is the first time that the British Army fought the volunteers. So what was the Fermoy Arms Raid? Well, in the early hours of the 7th of September, 1919, Members of the local British Army barracks marched the local Wesleyan church there. And members of Lynch's 
you know, brigade. They had kind of scoped out, you know, their route, you know, for the last few Sundays. They had to ambush the British soldiers and take the rifles because, you know, arms and, you know, ammunition were a major concern for many IRA brigades, all IRA brigades actually throughout the War of Independence. And Liam Lynch and his men knew that this was a means for them to get arms. Now, Liam develops a tendency that, again, he has throughout the War of Independence that not only does he plan the operation, you know, he takes, he's very careful with the planning, hearing out suggestions, contributing suggestions of his own, but he also directly takes part in many of these actions that he plans. So his physical bravery was another reason that he so impresses those under his command and it helps him build up his military prestige through this period. So again, to return to the morning of the 7th of September, so there's volunteers on the main street and for my they also have two cars that have commanded for the operation. Liam Lynch is in one of these cars. And as roughly 20 British soldiers march to the local Wesleyan church, Liam Lynch is in one of the cars going behind the soldiers. And just as they're about to enter the church, the car swings behind them, you know, blocking off their potential escape route. Liam Lynch jumps out of the car, he blows the whistle, and he demands that the soldiers surrender. So roughly over the course of two or three minutes, you know, the volunteers grapple with the British soldiers with their guns, a couple of shots go off. One soldier, William Jones, is, one British soldier, William Jones, is killed, and only one is wounded on the volunteer side, Liam Lynch. Now, in the aftermath, the volunteers seize about 19 rifles. They jump into the two cars that they disperse into the surrounding streets. And there's an inquest into the death of the British Army soldier who was killed, William Jones, the next day. The sympathetic jury ruled that wasn't murder. And that night in Fermoy, the Monday night, the local British army inflicted terrible revenge on the town of Fermoy. And the scenes that would kind of be reminiscent in other parts of the country. And in the aftermath, as I said, Liam Lynch was wounded. He was actually so elated at the success of the raid. When they were taking Lynch out of Fermoy after the raid in the car, he was so excited at what happened. He actually didn't notice he'd been wounded in the shoulder. And they only noticed as Liam started talking, you know, blood was seeping down his uh, coat and that. But because it was such a close flesh wound, it actually took him several weeks to recover. He was moved around the brigade. He was put in different hideouts and so on. But he was still kind of very active in kind of keeping on top of what's going on. They were sending him communications and so on. Now, in the aftermath of the Fermoy Arms Raid, the local RAC and British Army arrested several local volunteers, most notably the head of the Fermoy Battalion. This man f- pictured in the middle here of this slide, Mick Fitzgerald, a very close comrade and close friend of Liam Lynch's. Now, Mick Fitzgerald was held on remand by the British military authorities for several months, and he actually began a hunger strike in the summer of 1920. And this this lasted for 67 days until he died on hunger strike in October 1920, several days before Terence McSweeney died on hunger strike in Brixton Prison. Now, his death left an enormous impact on Liam Lynch. As I said, they were very close. And on the night of Fitzgerald's funeral in Fermoy, well, the night before the funeral, Liam Lynch was, allowed, was brought to the church as he was on the run at the time. And the local volunteers opened the coffin firm to give him a chance to say goodbye to his old comrade. And there's some very moving accounts of Lynch's visit to the church that night. You know, he shakes, you know, Fitzgerald's worn hand. And, you know, the volunteers say he had a look of anguish and sorrow on his face. And you can see in his correspondence, you know, particularly as we kind of go into the truce period and the Civil War, the memory of his dead comrades really motivated him through the difficult days ahead. He writes to Tom in one letter in late 1921, the following, were it not that I continually think of my dead comrades and the glorious fight we fight for, it would be more than impossible to sometimes carry on. Now, another very famous action by his brigade during the War of Independence was the kidnap of a general from the British Army 6th Division. They were based, you know, in the Cork area. General, I'll give his full name here, actually, because it's a very long name, General Cuthbert Henry Tyndall Lucas. Now, on the right here is a very famous photo that was taken after Lucas was kidnapped. It's a proof of life photo that the IRA issued to the British military authorities, you know, just to prove that, you know, not only was Lucas kidnapped, but he was still alive in their custody. Now, you can probably guess who the very uh, unimpressed general is. He's the man sitting in the centre with his arms folded and, you know, the others around him are very jovial members of the Irish volunteers. Actually, they're members of the East Clare Brigade. The general had was moved. So basically... What, what this operation involved was Liam Lynch, you know, General and his men fished outside, you know, for Moy and Lynch and some of his leading officers planned the operation. They, you know, they they kidnapped Lucas. They took him to an, a safe house to kind of hold him in that. And Le- Lucas was held, only held in captivity for a few days in the Cork and Brigade before he was moved on. Now, 
Lynch was only the only one allowed to speak to Lucas while he was under their custody. And Lucas, according to one account, said to Lynch that the IRA can't make a dent in the British armour and resistance is futile. And Lynch says to him in turn that in the Fenian tradition, that the fight would help inspire others to fight later if we were beaten in the field. And Lucas actually later escaped from captivity when he was held in the Clare Brigade area. Now, to be clear, he was deliberately let go because he'd become such a high-profile target. But he actually said to the press in his release that he was treated uh, he was treated like a gentleman by gentlemen. So he was actually very uh, strangely complimentary to his captors. Now, as we move into early 1923, Cork Number 2 brigades, particularly brigades in the southwest, you know, Court number two and its neighbor brigades, they come under a lot of pressure from British military raids and you know there's unsuccessful ambushes and so on. There's a very devastating one at Morn Abbey in the court number two area, in which members of the court number two brigade are killed and others just narrowly escape. Now Lynch wasn't there, but he, he was he was he was informed uh, of this. And the IRA General Headquarters, headed by its Chief of Staff, Richard Mulcahy, and of course Michael Collins was a key player in the General Headquarters, they began forming the IRA brigades into divisions so that they're kind of an overall command for some of these brigades. So the first one of these divisions that's formed is the IRA's first Southern Division. And this includes all three Cork brigades, including Cork Number 2 Brigade, three Carrier Brigades, two Waterford Brigades, and the West Limerick Brigade. And Liam Lynch is appointed the head of the First Southern Division. And also this time he gets a seat on the Supreme Council of the Irish Republican Brotherhood, that kind of secret society that aided the revolutionary movement during the period. And of course, Michael Collins was the president of the IRB. So by the time of the truce on the 9th of July, 1921, with the command of the First Southern Division and his seat on the Supreme Council, Liam Lynch is the most influential IRA officer outside the Dublin leadership of the IRA. So that was the ninth. That, that was roughly. Sorry, I got the dates around. So ninth of July. It was actually the eleventh of July, 1921. Of course, it's true. The ninth of July is when the Cork Number Two Brigade is split into two: Cork Number Two Brigade and Cork Number Four Brigade. Because, you know, the the Cork Number Two Brigade under Lynch had been so active that was the reason they split it. But two days after the Cork Number Two Brigade is split on the eleventh of July, 1921, a truce is declared between the IRA and the British. This comes as a great shock to many in the revolutionary movement. But the truce period that then follows, you know, Liam Lynch uses an opportunity for his men to drill and to train. And as Liam's deputy, Liam Deeshy, noted in his own memoir, Brother Against Brother, Lynch drove himself relentlessly during the truce period and he expected a similar dedication from his staff. Now, it's worth noting as well, the truce period was also a time for, you know, recuperation and relaxation for the volunteers. And Lynch in this period actually got engaged to his girlfriend, Bridget or Bridie Keys, as she was commonly known. She was a draper's assistant who, resi- who was a resident of Mitchestown, very close to Liam, and they had met during uh, Liam's time in the Gaelic League classes and the dances and so on. But of course, the situation in Ireland dramatically accelerates with the signing of the Anglo-Irish Treaty on the 6th of December, 1921, of course, which paves the way for the formation of the 26th County Irish Free State, a dominion of the British Empire, and it cements partition. It doesn't create partition, but it cements that the Northern Ireland state, of course, has been established over a year at this point. And of course, the revolution movement begins to split over this. Now, in the signing of the treaty, Liam Lynch said to his comrade, Moss Toomey, that he was shocked and surprised by its signing. And he said, all that has been done all the sacrifices that have been betrayed. And as head of the IRA's first sudden division, Lynch issues the following statement. The treaty as it was drafted is not acceptable to us as representing the army in the first divisional area, and we urge its rejection by the government. So again, we've Liam Lynch leading the way, you know, pioneered the warfare during the War of Independence. And here he is now, you know, the, he's the first section of the IRA putting forward their view of the treaty that, you know, they don't accept it. And the IRB Supreme Council, again, which Liam was a member of, subsequently voted in favour for the settlement to be ratified by Dáil Éireann. So what, knowing that the members of the Supreme Council don't agree, the Supreme Council instead voted in a majority for it to be ratified by Dáil Éireann, if the members of Dáil Éireann so choose to do that. And Liam Lynch didn't agree with this. And he wrote to his comrade, Flory O'Donoghue, the following day. He said, I admire Michael Collins, a soldier and a man. Thank God all the parties can agree to differ. Because it's important to note there was still a great respect there between Liam Lynch and his pro-treaty opponents, such as Michael Collins and Richard Mulcahy. You know, they endured a lot together during the War of Independence. But it's worth noting for the six months 
until the start of the Civil War. So from December 1921 until late June 1922, Liam Lynch is very central to repair the split in the IRA. Now, before I continue that further, just explain his anti-treaty position. He, of course, sees it as a betrayal of the Republic, you know, betrayal of the comrades who died for the Republican cause in the War of Independence. And he would stand alongside other notable anti-treaty IRA leaders, such as Rory O'Connor and Liam Mellows. You know, they were two of the most notable opponents of the treaty also. And the anti-treaty section of the IRA pushed for the holding of an IRA convention to take place that March. This was in a meeting. Well, the planned idea for the meeting was that all IRA brigades would meet and the IRA would then put forward its view on the treaty. Now, the pro-treaty provisional government that was chaired by Michael Collins, you know, banned this convention from taking place because what the members of the anti-treaty IRA wanted to do, they wanted to repudiate the authority of Dáil Éireann. The Dáil had voted to accept the treaty that January. So the members of the anti-treaty IRA, such as Lynch, O'Connor and Mellows, they felt, well, we can no longer, you know, be the army of Dáil Éireann because Dáil Éireann, in our view, doesn't stand for the Republic. So they wanted the IRA to revert to its status as an independent body, which the Irish volunteers had been, you know, prior to the War of Independence. Now, despite the banning by Michael Collins' uh, provisional government, the convention still goes ahead. So the convention is held in late March and early April at the Mansion House there. And Liam Lynch is unanimously elected the Chief of Staff of the Anti-Treaty IRA. And again, this shows the respect that is held for Liam amongst his comrades, you know, that he becomes head of this section. But as I said, he would be central to efforts to repair the split over the treaty. Because what Liam Lynch wanted above all, and this even recurs in his correspondence during the Civil War, he wanted a united IRA because he knew a united movement and a united IRA was the best means to resist British rule in Ireland. Because, you know, some of them expected that the war with the British was to resume this time and they needed a strong IRA to be able to, you know, resist kind of British, you know, military efforts to, you know, you know, firm up British rule in Ireland and so on. That was very important to Liam Lynch. So, a very poignant photo here on the slide here. This is from the 2nd of May, 1922. And this is a meeting between pro and anti-treaty IRA leaders. And it was sort of, it's referred to as a truce committee because there was kind of like low level incidents between members of the pro and anti-treaty IRA that had been occurring up until May, 1922. And this is sort of a meeting to kind of prevent these incidents to see if they find some sort of formula to work together in the time ahead. So respectively from left to right, we have Sean McKeown, of course, is pro-treaty, Sean Moyle and anti-treaty, a, a, a comrade close to Lynch and Cork and Mature Brigade, Ono Duffy, yes, the infamous Ono Duffy, who at the time was the pro-treaty IRA chief of staff, Lynch beside him, and Geroyd O'Sullivan, pro-treaty, and Lee Mellows, anti-treaty. And I think what's very poignant about that photo, within two months of that photo being taken, you know, those men are fighting each other in the Civil War. And you actually see a British pate newsreel of this meeting as well and you can see them kind of liking the photo there being very jovial and laughing and it's worth noting within 11 months of that photo being taken both Liam Lynch and Liam Mellows have been killed and Liam is also central to this uh, northern offensive idea which I could probably spend an hour speaking and trying to figure out but just in brief it was a plan by Collins and Lynch to have both pro and anti-treaty IRA units attack positions in Northern Ireland to kind of destabilize the new Northern state, but beyond a brief skirmish with the British army in Patagon Balik in late May 1922, this Northern offensive goes nowhere and is abandoned, much to the consternation of anti-treaty IRA leaders such as Lynch. And of course, on the 16th of June 1922, we had the general election, the first held since the treaty, and the pro-treaty parties, particularly pro-treaty Sinn Féin, win a majority for the new parliament, which would be, of course be the third Dáil Éireann. And on the same day of this election, Liam writes to his brother Tom and he says, well, Tom, the situation generally is beyond anything I could any longer hold out hope for. I always held out hopes to the last, but really all are blighted now. I feel all my, life, all my life's work has been in vain. This is a terrible way to feel. Would we could even get back all our glorious dead? So again, he's thinking of the Patriot dead. This is what partly what really motivates Lynch in this period. Now, they have intentions on his own side, too, because the likes of Rory O'Connor, Lee Mellows, and the IRA officers in the four courts weren't happy with Lee Lynch's efforts of moderation with Collins and Richard Mulcahy. And Lynch, Lynch and his first subdivision officers were actually locked out of the four courts in mid June 1922, briefly replaced as chief of staff with Joe McKelvey. And the Clarence Hotel across the Liffey is the base for Lynch and the first subdivision officers. Now, on the night of the 27th of June 1922, both sections of the anti-treaty IRA were against each other, you know, one headed by O'Connor and Mellows, 
the other are headed by Lynch. They have negotiations in the four courts and they agree that Liam Lynch will resume the position of anti-treaty IRA chief of staff. Now note the date I just mentioned, the night of the 27th of June, 1922. Many of you will know what happened in the early hours of the following morning, the bombardment of the four courts began. Now, Lynch wasn't in the forecourts at the time. He was back over in his base, the Clarence Hotel. And Liam Deasy writes in his memoir, Brother Against Brother, to two men in their hotel room listening to the bombardment of the forecourts in the early hours of the morning. A very poignant line from Liam Deasy. For both of us, myself and Liam, it was the end of a dream. Gone now was the unity that had brought us to the threshold of freedom. And now the Irish Civil War had truly begun. Now, with the attack in the forecourts, begun, you know, that kind of cut off those in the four courts from, you know, the rest of the IRA in the city. The Battle of Dublin plays out for over a week. But on the very day of the bombardment of the four courts began, Lynch is a meeting at the Clarence Hotel of leading figures in the first subdivision. You know, Eamon de Valera is there, Cahill Brew is there. And they all agreed, you know, they'll now resist the free state in arms. You know, there's going to be no more peace negotiations, no more attempted conferences to bring both sides together. The Republic has been attacked and they must defend it. And Liam Lynch starts to venture down to the south, specifically to the town of Mallow, to set up a base there. And on the following day, after the bombardment of the four courts begins, he has a meeting of members of the First Southern Division. And they agree to defend Republican territory in the south, below what's called the Limerick Waterford Line. So if you know where Limerick City is in the east and Waterford City in the west, there's going to be a defensive line established along that, and they'll defend all territory there in the south and hold it for the Republic. Now, this is often referred to in accounts as the Munster Republic or Liam Lynch's Munster Republic. I want to be absolutely clear about this. And Flory O'Donoghue, his first biographer, noted this also in his, in his notes. There was no such thing as the Munster Republic. What Liam Lynch wanted to do was hold the south of Ireland for the existing republic as declared in 1916, ratified by Dáil Éireann in 1919. As Lynch says in one communication to Ernie O'Malley, if we hold Limerick City, it'll do a long way to upholding the Republic. Again, the existing Republic. He never uses the term once Republic. Doesn't even recur on propaganda issued at the time. The closest example is here on this left, this handbill distributed by Republicans. It says the Army of the South is united under Liam Lynch in defence of, again, the Republic. Men of Dublin, where do you stand with the English allies or with the United State of Ireland? This was kind of directed towards pro-treaty um, Dublin IRA men at the start of the Civil War, because at this point, of course, the pro-treaty IRA can now be considered the National Army of the Irish Free State. Its commander-in-chief, of course, Michael Collins, Liam Lynch's once, you know, trusted and close comrade. And Republicans quickly lose this territory because, you know, it's worked out in the anti-treaty IRA didn't have a chance to prepare any military strategy. This is as true as Liam Lynch as it is of Rory O'Connor and Liam Mellows. There's no grand plan. They don't prepare for civil war. And of course, the National Army is backed up by finances and resources in the British government and its leadership and that of the new government, too, is made up of former comrades who know Liam Lynch and their comrades, know their tactics, know their hideouts, know their base of operations. So across the early weeks of July 1922 into early August, there's these coastal landings of free state forces. They land in Waterford, they land in Cork, they land in Kerry. And there's a truce temporarily in Limerick City between pro and anti-treaty forces. Lynch is there in Limerick City. But this truce collapses. So, you know, they lose all their territory by early August 1922. But Liam Lynch advocates return to guerrilla tactics. These are the familiar guerrilla tactics of the War of Independence. And he issues Operation Order Number 9. This is like ordering his units to return to guerrilla tactics. And Lynch later explains in a communication to De Valera that his intention is to bring the free state like as in the new Irish Free State, to the brink of economic collapse by destroying infrastructure. And you can see this in some of the tactics that play out across July and August 1922. You know, as Republicans retreat from the territory, barracks are burnt in Cork, you know, bridges are blown up. And then, of course, railways, like, you know, railway lines are destroyed. And a lot of this is prevent the movement of national army troops. But it does kind of create economic hardship in these areas in the south. You know, it kind of kind of ruins, you know, some Republican support from the local populace because, you know, the pro treaty side would have felt, you know, the majority of people voted us, voted for us in the June election. You know, we now have the political authority to carry out the people's will and so on. And the Republican view of Liam Lynch notice would be like, well, this isn't the will of the people because, you know, the British army, you know, threatened to invade if you didn't sign the treaty, you know, as Liam Mel articulated in the treaty debates this isn't the will of the people this is the fear of the people so they wouldn't have seen the june election as legitimate in their view 
But, you know, it's worth noting, you know, across much of Irish society, you know, there was support for the free state. Now, there was, you know, some of that support was a bit ambivalent, you know, different sections of Irish society, such as the church and big businesses and so on, supported the free state for their own reasons, you know. But, you know, it's, it's a very different battleground that Liam Lynch and his IRA are operating in, very different from the War of Independence, where he had the support for the Dáil and the underground institutions, you know, there was support for the IRA because of British atrocities and so on. That's not there during the Civil War. And if anything, you know, support fades even more over the course of the conflict. And, you know, some on Lynch's side, they recognize this, but, you know, Lynch is hoping that they'll find some sort of military advantage, you know, over the free stage, you know, kind of bring them to negotiating terms and so on. Now, when we talk about the return to guerrilla tactics, you know, Lynch says to Ernie O'Malley in one memo on the 18th of August, 1922, that he's thoroughly satisfied with the situation now. And, Four days after he writes that memo, 22nd of August, 1922, there's an ambush of Michael Collins's convoy in West Cork. Collins is killed. And Lynch, though, you know, he privately regrets Collins is that he does say in a report to Liam Deeshi that this was the most successful operation against such odds. He's very proud that his men have carried out this operation because he knows what a big loss to the free state side this would be. And guerrilla tactics are successful. You know, I, I don't buy into this notion that the civil war is lost in the first few weeks, you know, as territory is lost, you know, you know, Republicans managed to capture towns, they captured Dundalk and Loud, you know, Ballina, Mayo, the day before the third all meets in September, and they hold the town of Khmer and Kerry for several weeks. And if you look at pro-treaty government sources during this time, they agree that like where the anti-treaty IRA is active, it's, you know, keeping their forces busy, you know. Now, Liam Lynch is very, you know, Praising these guerrilla tactics, you know, he says to Liam Deasy about one ambush that the gallantry displayed by our troops on this occasion was undoubtedly splendid. But there's a problem with Liam Lynch's military thinking during the Civil War. He was a brilliant guerrilla commander during the War of Independence. You know, I, I was only managed to touch on briefly two of his most famous operations, but he was probably one of the best, if not the best, of the period in terms of being a guerrilla commander. But he's not a very successful commander in chief during the Civil War. And that's borne out in the accounts and memoirs of those who wrote about him after. You know, there's still respect there for him, but he wasn't a particularly successful commander in chief. He doesn't look at the political picture, like I just mentioned, in terms of, you know, the pro treaty having majority support in the country. And of course, with guerrilla tactics being successful, the Free State government feel they have to respond. And they do respond most brutally with their executions policy. Now, this is officially the Army Emergency Powers Resolution, which is passed by Dáil Éireann on the 27th of September 1922. It results in the setting up of free state military courts, as we know, with powers of executions for offences such as carrying arms or attacks on, you know, National Army and so on by members of the anti-treaty IRA. Now, just to emphasise that photo up there in the top right, that is a staged photo. Sometimes it's presented as an actual photo of an execution. It's staged. It's not even very accurate as to how the executions would have been carried out. There's no sandbags behind the prisoner, for instance, and the shooting party is just a bit too close there. But I think it was kind of, you know, generated for propaganda purposes. But there's no evidence that it was actually ever widely published. And of course, there in the bottom left is an example of probably one of the most successful aspects of Republican military policy I mentioned before, the, you know, destruction of railways, which of course leads to train derailments such as there pictured. Now, the executions begin in October. But events dramatically accelerate with the execution of the Republican leader Erskine Childers on the 24th of November. Liam Lynch issues a letter of protest to the Speaker of the Dáil, and he says, every member of the Dáil who voted for the resolution by which you, you hope to make legal the murder of our soldiers are equally guilty, an equal number of the Dáil is to be shot on sight. And then he, issue, he issues subsequent orders. He asks for the executions of all National Army members who are involved in the executions, he says, you know, all TDs who voted for the legislation should be shot on sight. And he orders the destructions of homes and mansions belong to the TDs and high profile supporters of the Free State. Now, of course, what takes place from the 7th to the 8th of December shows how very brutal, you know, the conflict has become by the end of the year. So on the 7th of December, the pro treaty TD and Corps Commandant Sean Hales is assassinated by members of the anti treaty IRA on the streets of Dublin City. And in response, the Free State government takes out four of the, the leadership of imprisoned since the fall of the four courts, the Republican leadership, Rory O'Connor, Lee Mellows, Joe McKelvey, and Dick Barrett. Now, to be clear, these four had been imprisoned since the fall of the four courts in July 1922. 
They had absolutely nothing to do with the death of Sean Hales the day before. But the government, the Irish government at the time, admitted that the four men were executed on the 8th of December 1922 as a reprisal for the death of Hales. It was to demoralise Liam Lynch's forces. You know, you kill one of our own, this is what we're going to do to you. And of course, you know, under the likes of the Geneva Convention and so on like that, that should not have happened. Now, in the doll on the morning, or the doll actually that afternoon after the four men had been executed, Richard Mulcahy, who replaced Collins as commander in chief of the National Army and was minister of defence, which again is legally a bit questionable, but he defends the executions the following day in the doll. And he said that it was Lynch's threat against TDs that, you know, made this necessity. Now, none of us, you know, like if you really look at it in the cold light of day, you know, those executions are not justifiable. And, you know, we can be critical of the execution policy of the Free State during the Civil War. Sometimes the number 77 is given. Recent research has shown it's actually 81 are executed during the Civil War. And, you know, arguably, they were effective. We don't have to agree with that. We don't have to agree with the fact they happened, but they were effective. They had the intent, you know, the, the intent of the Free State government was for them to demoralize Lynch's forces, and they did. There's no widespread killing of TDs that happened during the Civil War. Hales is the only one killed. And um, again, so by December 1922, you know, the execution policy is continuing in earnest. And in September 1922, just before they began, we, we get a very interesting, very rare personal insight into Liam Lynch's personal thinking at this time. So I mentioned, you know, instances of his military dispatches where he's very positive, you know, talking to his officers, you know, and he talks up a Republican victory a lot. But what he says to his brother, Tom, who is again a priest and probably as close as confident, he says, the disaster of this war is sinking to my very bones when I count the general horrors of civil war. Who could have dreamt that all our hopes could have been so blighted? And then that December 1922, after the executions had begun, Liam Lynch says the following. He says, would that English hounds had tracked me down than old comrades who had been false to their allegiance. You know, he's not celebratory of this fight. He's not celebrating the civil war. He knows it's very different in nature to the war of independence. He's not enjoying this. He's not enjoying, you know, you know, you know, issuing these orders and, you know, having to attack his former comrades, you know, like he wants to stand for the Republic. He feels he has to do it. He doesn't like doing it. So I, th I think those kind of instances of his personal correspondence are very interesting. Now, as we come into his final days, by March 1923, the military situation for the IRA, the anti-treaty IRA is getting quite desperate. Large stretches of the country, you know, don't see any activity during the Civil War now. And, you know, at this point, we have roughly about 8,000 members of the anti-treaty IRA active in the field. Roughly thirteen to 15,000 Republicans are in prison, including the IRA and coming them on and so on. And they're up against a force of roughly thirty to 45,000 National Army soldiers. So huge forces and huge odds that the anti-treaty IRA are up against. And Lynch's adjutant, Moss Toomey, writes to him in one report in early March that news is not encouraging these days. There's not been a decent operation, whatever the cause is. And that's one reason at the end of March 1923 that Liam Lynch has a meeting of the surviving anti-treaty IRA leadership in rural Waterford and, you know, they, they move location and that. And at that executive meeting of, sorry, that meeting of the anti-treaty IRA executive there's a motion defeated that's put forward by Tom Barry. So Tom Barry, you know, many of you know him, the celebrated hero of Kil Kilmichael and Cross Barry during the War of Independence. He put forward a motion for the fighting to stop an open peace negotiation with the Free State Government. But the motion is voted down by a majority of one, Liam Lynch's vote. And Liam Lynch was trying to argue that he was trying to get heavy artillery for the anti-treaty IRA. And he'd sent one of his top corps commandants, John Moylan, actually initially to the United States and then to Germany to try and acquire this heavy artillery. This is his last grand military strategy to hopefully turn, you know, the fighting in Republicans' favour. Now, knowing that it was a majority of one, Lynch agreed to have a later meeting of the anti-treaty IRA executive in April, because again, I talked about he wanted a unified IRA. This is still a paramount concern for him during the Civil War. He wanted to keep everyone on side. He knew he needed a united movement and army. But of course, he never gets to that next meeting, because on the 10th of April, 1923, you know, while fleeing a National Army column, you know, with some of his men up the Knockmilda Mountains in South Tipperary, he's shot and mortally wounded, and he dies several hours later. 
It's a very impressive Liam Lynch Memorial Tower that's there today, a photo there on its right. If you ever get a chance to visit that part of Ireland, strongly advise you to visit the Memorial Tower. And I could certainly recommend some great tour guides to take you up there and show you the route that Lynch took and so on. Very impressive. But yeah, he, he is shot there on the 10th of April, 1923. And he finds a, you know, a very unusual kinship with the leader of the National Army flying column that finds him, a man called Lawrence Clancy, who'd been a member of the South Tipperary IRA and had gone pro-treaty during the Civil War. And they take Liam Lynch to a public house in Newcastle Village, which is just below the Knockman Down Mountains before they bring him to Clonmel Military Hospital where he dies. And Liam Lynch has one request for Clancy. Well, he's you know, some small requests, but his biggest one is bury me with Fitzgerald of Fermoy, the greatest comrade I ever had on this earth. So you recall I mentioned Mick Fitzgerald, his comrade who died in hunger strike. He's still thinking of him three years later and he makes a request to be buried with him. And Lawrence Clancy says to him, is that the hunger striker? And Lynch is surprised that Clancy knows who Mick Fitzgerald is. And Clancy explains that he was a member of the South Tipperary IRA and he had two brothers, Pat and Martin, who had been killed during the War of Independence. And Liam Lynch, you know, he raises his hand to Clancy and he says, shake hands. I'm glad one of the old crowd got me. And Clancy, a very moving account that you can actually read on the RT website. It was just published there the other day. And Clancy and his account said he realized he too was crying. And he Lynch says to Clancy, all this is a pity. It never should have happened. I'm glad now I'm going from it all. Poor Ireland. Poor Ireland. And Lynch dies several hours later when he's taken to the Clonmel Military Hospital. And there on the left is the scene as his coffin is passed through Mitchestown on the way to Fermoy, where he's buried there with his comrade Mick Fitzgerald in Kilcorper Cemetery, just outside Fermoy. Now, Frank Aiken replaces Liam Lynch as chief of staff, and he asks Eamon de Valera, the main Republican political leader, to open negotiations with the Free State. And hostilities end on the part of the anti treaty IRA at the end of April. But these negotiations go nowhere, and as a result, Frank Aiken issues the Dump Arms Order on the 24th of May, 1923, the centenary of which was just Wednesday. And this brings an end to the military fighting in the Civil War. But it's worth noting that, you know, violence continues, you know, some executions still occur, still extrajudicial killings of Republican prisoners, like what happened at Bally City in March. And, you know, Republicans continue to the struggle, so to speak, in, in, the, in the Free State prisons for months and months thereafter. There's hunger strikes, tree dying, hunger strike, and so on. But the 24th of May does mark the official end of military fighting on the part of Republicans, but there's no negotiated surrender and there's certainly no equivalent statement on the side of the Free State. But just to go back to Liam Lynch, you know, who we're here to talk about today, when we look at his life by any measure, his journey was an extraordinary one. And I really do think he's one of the most extraordinary figures that emerged in this period in Ireland. It's impressive that as an ordinary shop assistant, he found in himself an extraordinary sense of self-belief and a profound dedication to the Republican cause to become a gifted, gifted guerrilla commander of the Cork No. 2 Brigade. He planned many important IRA operations against British forces, and he also directly took part in them. So it should no surprise he won the admiration of those under his command, many of whom would remain dedicated to his memory for decades after his death. They built memorials to him, you know, throughout the South and the Southwest and so on. They took part in, you know, the commemorations. They wrote memoirs and accounts of Liam Lynch, you know, very, you know, celebratory Tory accounts of his life and that. Now, we look at him during the Civil War, while his gifts as guerrilla commander don't result in him being a very effective, overly effective commander in chief. It must be noted that the anti treaty IRA faced a new professional military force that only backed with resources and finance they never would have had, but also made up of their former comrades who knew the personnel and knew the tactics of those on the other side. And Liam Lynch was receiving military reports and he knew they were losing, but he didn't see the prospect of peace. You know, he felt that it failed, you know, before the Civil War and so on. But he wanted to find the new means to Republicans to gain the military momentum. But he died before he could contemplate he may have to end the IRA's military resistance to the Free State. And as his comrade Todd Andrews later wrote in his memoir, with Liam Lynch's death, I knew the end of the Civil War had come. Only his iron will had kept it going in those last few months. And it's worth noting when that terror there on the right was unveiled in 1935. Liam Lynch's former comrade Moss Toomey spoke at its unveiling. And Toomey at the time was the IRA chief of staff and he was on the run from de Valera's government. And at the unveiling, Toomey said the following. He said that Liam Lynch detested the thought of war between Irishmen and England's interest and at the behest of England. He strove with all his might to avert such a national tragedy. Yet when the rebellion against the Republic was launched against it, there was no one so unrelenting in the war of his defence. 
Now, Liam Lynch is commemorated by many groups and political parties today who trace their tradition back to the anti-treaty side of the Civil War. And to all those who admire him, he's a great Republican hero who died before he had to face total defeat or surrender, unconquerable to the end. And he's often represented in speeches, and you know, we, you know, we would have heard some of them this past Easter as the purest representation of the Irish Republican ideal and a heroic example to inspire all Republicans into the future. And at the very first oration at his graveside on the day of his funeral, 1923, the Republican TD, William Stockley, said the following, and I think I'll close on this. Ireland should be allowed to live her own life. It was in that spirit that Liam Lynch lived and acted and died. And alongside the record of his enormous contribution to the War of Independence, this commemorative component of his legacy will endure far beyond the centenary of his death, I think. Thank you very much, everyone. And thank you for listening to me this afternoon. Well, thank you, Gerard. And I, I have to say that was uh, a wonderful summary uh, for people who are not introduced to Liam Lynch in the time allotted here. You've done a marvelous job of, of laying out a, a great broad overview. I guess I would be remiss uh, as a member of the AOH in not mentioning that before that galvanizing a moment when he sees the Kent brothers paraded through the street, uh, Lynch's involvement in nationalism was the sort of moderate, respectable uh, nationalism. He was a member of the AOH Board of Aaron, for example, at the time. That's right. That's and, right. And, and the, the, the Gaelic uh, League, right? So, but the, the Kent yeah. brothers' arrest and that that gun battle and the and the execution sort of uh, was that galvanizing moment for him. Very much so. And uh, that recurs in several accounts of his contemporaries who who knew him. Like, like he would refer back to that an awful lot, the arrest of the Kents. And he became very close to the surviving, well, one of the surviving Kent brothers, David Kent, um, and David Kent seemed to become something of a mentor for Liam, like beginning from like 1917. And there's even a reference to the meeting during the Civil War in Todd Andrews' memoir. So yeah, the memory of the Kents and the fact that like he saw Thomas Kent and he got it, knowing that he was then just executed a week later, that's a huge impact on him. So it's interesting that when, you know, you talk of the radicalization of that generation after the 1916 rising, you know, it was the executions that radicalized a lot of people who subsequently joined the ranks of the Sinn Féin and the volunteers. But for Liam Lynch, it was just very unique that he saw one of them just before he was executed. So absolutely. And just in reference to like, you know, his, his previous political affiliation. Yes, he was a member of kind of like, as you say, respectable nationalism. And, you know, that recurs in the accounts of others too, that, he, you know, he was very much supportive of home rule and probably would have been considered a Red Knight. Now, I don't think he was a militant Red Knight in the sense that like, you know, when, Redmond issues that call for those to join the British Army, you know, it seems to be kind of reluctance in Liam to kind of really kind of obviously he doesn't go and join the British Army or anything, but I think that kind of maybe dents his fate in the, the Redmondite cause, shall we say, but he, he doesn't become an avowed Republican until after the events of the Rising, definitely. And you mentioned his uh, prowess as a guerrilla leader, as a military tactician in the War of Independence. Uh, I thought it was interesting in, in reading your book that he sort of uh, didn't have any military background, but engaged in self-study of the Boer War and studied the tactics of the Boers. Yeah, and I, I genuinely think that's one of the most extraordinary things about the person he was. Like, he, he's very much an exemplary example of someone of that generation who joined. I mean, a lot of them who would have joined the volunteers didn't have former soldiering experience and it wasn't unique to Liam. I mean, there wasn't even a soldiering and it would have been a British soldiering tradition, of course, if it had been one, but there's no soldiering tradition in his family. As you say, he was just, and you see, he seemed to have been a very studious figure. I mean, he read a lot of Irish history texts, particularly Republican inclined texts, you know, in his youth and that, and that seemed to kind of influence his politics. But yeah, when it came to the time of like him joining the volunteers and, you know, as you say, he studied books to the Boer War and so on. And you see, not only that as well, like, I mean, he, he, he like he made sure he got to know, you know, how these things work, like, you know, so, you know, he, he visited the areas, he visited the men under his command. And there's some very interesting accounts of how people, you know, saw him develop through that time, not only when he moved up the ranks, but he became more confident in himself. And then he dealt with others, like, you know, and I, I think that's one of the reasons that contributes to the success of his, you know, command during the war of independence like he really got to know the area he wanted to visit all the area and he got to know the men he got to know their strengths and their weaknesses in particular areas that again that recurs again and again throughout the period so yeah it's just that prevent like I, i'm not saying it's a mystery like but it, it kind of leaves me in awe a bit where he found that energy and dedication you know because it just seemed to impress even those at the time who were with him like they were in awe of it too you know and you describe in the book after the shelling of the four courts when Lynch uh, leaves Dublin and he has two encounters with free state forces yeah. in which uh, he's released each time 
And it sort of illustrates the disbelief on both sides, perhaps, that they were actually going to engage in violence against one another. Yeah, it's a very interesting episode, particularly when um, initially when he tries to leave Dublin, he's picked up by uh, a free state group that consists of uh, a man called Liam Tobin, who he would have known very well. And they take him to uh, Ono Duffy and what's now Griffith Barracks or became Griffith Barracks, right? It's now a college, Griffith College. And uh, him and Ona Duffy have a very interesting conversation. And I, I, I think I think when you read accounts of what they discussed, now we can only go on what Lynch and Duffy said to others, that I think the two of them were kind of talking around each other and trying to scope the other out. Because Lynch would have been seen by those on the pro treaty side, like O'Duffy, Mulcahy and Collins as a moderate. They wouldn't have imagined that Liam Lynch would kind of fight them, so to speak. I think like it's very clear one of the reasons for the attack in the forecourts is that I think Collins and Mulcahy seem to have this belief that those in the forecourts, such as O'Connor Mellows, were sort of an isolated garrison on their own they kind of thought the split on the anti-treaty side was a bit maybe more stark than it actually was they wouldn't have been aware of the conference that lynch had with o'connor and mellows the night before to repair the split on their own side so yeah i mean i, I my read now is that lynch was very deliberately vague with O'Duffy as to what he was doing i mean because at that point as well that i mean a proclamation it's often called the four courts proclamation i make reference to it in the book have been drawn up and it's a very interesting document document it's kind of aped on the kind of language of the 1916 proclamation where it's like you know fellow citizens of the republic uh, the errors come our cause is being uh, treacherously assailed by recreant irishmen and it's a kind of republican call to arms and lynch signed that like but uh, it doesn't seem o'duffy is aware of it when he made some just out of the four courts begins because like, probably hadn't been distributed yet but then of course you know on his way to mallow he stops at castle Cumber barracks in kilkenny and there's no exchange there with free state officers and one of the free state officers says, hey, like, let's sign a bit of Phil's cap. So keep a memento of us gathering here together tonight. And it's later published to kind of uh, by the free state authorities, as an example of Liam Lynch signing an undertaking that he wouldn't take part in fighting. Now, I do think Lynch was deliberately vague with O'Duffy and the later party in Castlecomer Barracks, but I don't believe he gave an undertaking that he wouldn't fight. It just wasn't in his character to be that treacherous. But I think it does betray a political naivety on his part that, you know, particularly if he was to sign something, how the free state authorities would then take advantage of this, you, you know, again, just a bit of naivety and maybe maybe over optimism and the good faith of his opponents there as well. And you mentioned the sort of poignant uh, episode in the book where uh, a mortally wounded Lynch has this interaction with Clancy. It's mm -hmm. sort of, uh, it reminds us of the, the death of Harry Boland in your own hometown of Scaries, how the, yeah. the men on both sides uh, have this, you know, reluctance uh, to, to see each other killed, but they're also committed to their cause. Yeah, very much so. And like, it's, it's a very, it's a very moving piece, uh, Lawrence, Lawrence Clancy's account, which I would encourage everyone listening tonight to read. So it's an article I've written for the RT website. It was published out the other day, called Liam Lynch's Final Days. And they actually have the whole document from the National Library of Ireland, which is Clancy's typed account of this meeting with Lynch. I really would implore everyone to read it because it's also the letter that Clancy wrote to Liam Lynch's first biographer and his former comrade, Florio Donahue. And it's a very moving account where, like, it's Clancy writing three decades later what he thinks of Liam Lynch in the Civil War. And it's extraordinarily moving. But, I mean, the fact that, like, in Lynch's final hours, he finds his kinship. And I think, I think like, as you say, like, neither are kind of rejecting the cause they're fighting for, but they kind of see each other as, as, as normal people and former comrades, like, you know, because... Like a, a brilliant uh, historian from that part of the country, Michael Desmond, uh, has made the point to me before that, like, you know, you have these kind of um, killings of Republican prisoners, like extra unofficial executions, shall we say, you know, like at Bally City and Kerry, most notoriously. And I do think Lynch was very lucky that Clancy was the leader of the search party who found him, like, because I think Clancy found, you, you know, you know, just his basic decency and humanity to look after an inch and have him attended to, get a priest, get a doctor, so on, get him sent to the hospital. Though, he, though Clancy makes clear in his account, he knew he was he was probably mortally wounded and he was dying and that. So yeah, it's very interesting they have this exchange. Now, I think there's a lot of truth in what Clancy writes. Now, he, he clearly writes quite a period after it, but Lynch says certain details to him that only he could have known. Like, I mean, he flubs the name of his sister, in the Lynch's sister in the account, but like, you know, you can't be expected to remember every detail 30 years later, but the fact that Lynch says to him how much Mick Fitzgerald meant to him, but that's not something that would have been publicly known, like, do you know what I mean? And, you know, it's funny, like at the inquest, now Clancy's not called the inquest, but his commanding officer is, so he clearly had told his commanding officer that Lynch's request was to be buried with Mick Fitzgerald, like, and because De Valera really wanted Lynch buried in Glass Cemetery, specifically beside Cahill Brewer. And you can see this in 
like De Valera's papers. It was actually publicly reported at the time. I only realized that recently when I was looking for something else, because the idea was to have a big kind of Republican funeral, like, you know, Donovan Ross or, or something like that. Like, you know, um, so very interesting in that respect. But just uh, digressing a bit here, like, but no, the Clancy episode is a very interesting one. Definitely one kind of reading in full the accounts. And before we go, I want to make sure to, to talk about the book. You'll excuse the post-it notes on mine, but this is Liam Lynch to declare a republic. And uh, I got my copy on Amazon. I'm sure it's available at, at other other booksellers, right? Oh, definitely. Yeah, very much so. All right. Well, Danny, uh, I'll turn it over to you. Gerard, thank, that was incredible. Absolutely incredible. Thank you very much, Danny. Thank you. After being at the commemoration, and, and I actually was... Um, honored to walk at the front of the uh, front of the parade up to the um, cemetery and so forth. And I was, I was with his relatives. Oh, and, yeah. Yeah. I know a lot of them. Yeah. yeah. Great people. And I mean, they were yeah, just they are. so un- unbelievable, but they, and they said, this is really in their mind. The last was the last commemoration that they would have for him. Um, but his legacy has an impact on Ireland forever. We do have a, a, a couple of uh, questions, and and I know everyone. We're going a little bit long between uh, YouTube and um, in our Zoom. We have uh, just over thirty people, but what we'll do is we'll send this out uh, early next week to all of our officers around the country to share it out, and uh, this will be one that will get pushed hard on our YouTube. Um, if you could send me those links you mentioned, the RT link to your article, yeah, and. Definitely obviously put the link to your book in it as well Um, i was looking at it uh briefly um just before we went on and in my area i think you could get it tomorrow so so this is what amazon does uh what what they can do today on delivering these but a couple questions and i'm going to paraphrase uh uh the one here uh and then we're going to bring bob on to ask a question and then we're going to end because we're we're going slightly long but um, Kelly Dooley was asking um, uh, a question in the Zoom about the faith of Liam Lynch and what, how the faith um, um, impacted not just him, but did it impact the soldiers in, in uh, throughout the life uh, during the Civil War? How, how much did that play a role in your opinion? Yeah, Liam Lynch was very, very strong Catholic faith, like that, that recurs in his family. I mean, I mentioned two of his brothers joined religious orders, and he's probably close to confident in his life as his younger brother, Tom, who, of course, is a priest. He was a parish priest in uh, in Australia, actually. And uh, Tom seems to function as sort of a spiritual counselor for Liam to the period. And again, I'll, I'll give you this link as well, Danny, the link to like the letters that Liam wrote to Tom, like they're very, very interesting in that respect. When we come to kind of... Um, kind of Catholic faith of, you know, the Republican soldiers during the Civil War, of course, it was the Catholic bishops, the Irish Catholic bishops pastoral issued in September 1922 that condemned the actions of the anti-treaty IRA and their supporters. And this would have impacted a lot, just to speak broadly about it and how it then pertained to Liam Lynch, but this would have impacted um, a lot of those on the ground at the time because this meant they were denied the sacraments. And you even have instances, particularly that even recur after the Civil War, where Republicans are denied funerals in churches, like, um, you know, that that recurs as well in many accounts. So a lot of them would have shattered their fate. I mean, we do have some accounts of some of them never return to, you know, mass again after the Civil War. Now, that's not like, doesn't seem to be a common thing across the board, but there are some examples of that. Um, Liam Lynch's own personal fate wasn't dented by this. And there's a very interesting there's two episodes I came across where like in, in the in the days leading up to his death, where he was kind of in different hideouts before going to what he assumed was the next IRA executive meeting was that like, you know, he was spotted in some of these hideouts kind of with his rosary beads and praying like he was trying to find solace in his own personal faith, you know, through these very difficult times. And in Todd Andrews memoir, Dublin Made Me, which is an extraordinary account of the period and particularly of Liam Lynch, because Andrews was he was later a minister in some of Deb's governments, like, but he was an adjutant to Lynch in his final week. So Todd Andrews got to see Lynch up close. And Andrews would have been a great example of someone who, like, you know, at the time he, he said, I'm never going back to Mass again. Like, you know, he doesn't have, he rena- kind of renounced his faith. Now, as a young IRA volunteer, that that changes, you know, later and later after, to be clear. Like, but just at the time, he he wasn't have any, he didn't have any truck with it. Like, but he, he noticed in the hideouts, Liam Lynch's tendency to be praying. And he, he kind of questioned Lynch on this, like, because he would, what's interesting about the memory, he, he kind of challenges Lynch. He kind of asks him, 
what he thinks, the different things. And Lynch says to Andrews, look, there's, it's very different what the, the bishops say and what I believe, like what, what they what they kind of instruct, you know, you know, people to do. And what I personally believe, you know, in terms of my own Catholicism is different. So he was able to, in his own mind, separate the two, like what the Catholic bishop said in September, didn't, didn't dent his faith and didn't like, you know, you know, his routine of praying and saying the rosary and so on. And I think it's a very important thing to note about him. Well, thank you. And uh, I think Bob had his hand up inadvertently. It went down. But um, Rita O'Hara is our um, LAOH, Freedom for Ireland uh, chair. And it did a great job, incredible job this year with their with their uh, fundraising uh, for our work in the North Ireland. And she summed it up better than I could have. Spectacular presentation. Thank you so very much. And, and I wanted to make Thank sure you. that because it really was, I mean, it, re it really uh, jumped out um, to me. And we have uh, Chris Cook um, on with us, who helps us with all our technology work and Chris thank you very much uh, um, and, and and I know Chris understands uh, understands the work you do and we might have one last no that was it for the question so we're going to end uh, today I want to thank everybody for taking the time um, to be on uh, with us uh, Dan any closing comments and then we'll give uh, Gerard closing comments just want to thank Gerard again for his original scholarship and for the book and for being with us today. And, and we'll turn it over to Gerard for final comments. Yeah, and thank you very much, Daniel. Look, it was a pleasure to it was a pleasure to speak before you all here this afternoon. I, I think, you know, what I find about Liam Lynch is that, you know, relatives of his often say to me he's forgotten. But I, I think what they mean by that is that, you know, not so much that he was forgotten. He certainly remembered in the places that were very you know that he was active in and that he was he grew up in and fought in and so on but i think i think he's often faded from irish national memory and he's kind of faded from kind of the collective memory of when we think of this period so it's a great kind of honor to be his biographer and a historian about his life and bring his story to other places i've been up and down ireland the last few weeks kind of telling a story to different groups you know areas that you know, where he wouldn't have been active and he wouldn't really be commonly known. So it's great to bring his story to the fore. So I really appreciate the opportunity to bring him before an Irish American audience. Um, I hope I'm glad to hear you all enjoyed it. And I hope maybe in the future, I'll, I'll return again to another talk for you. We, we, we'd love to have you back. Um, we, it was fabulous. Um, and uh, Dan does such a great job. You fit right in with us and we will definitely uh, have you back. Well, thank you everybody for joining us. And I am going to close with a song from uh, Ryan Cahill. As down the glen one needs to run To a city fell for all drugs passed me by. No time to talk about it. It's a tattoo. But we right out in the body. I'm <laughs> While we tighten your tights with their long range guns, sailing into the foggy. Uh, rain fully and clear. For those who died at 
deep stood tight in the springing of the year. How the world did gaze with deep amaze at those fearless men, but few who bore the fight that freedom's light might shine through the foggy. And back through the glen, I rode again, and my heart with grief was sore, for I parted with valiant men. Whom I never shall see more. But to and through my dreams I go, and I feel for you. For Oh, oh, oh.